Here's uh, the Paul Lanka classic arranged by Don Costa. And now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll make it clear. I'll state my case, of which I am certain. I've lived a life that's full. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mark DiCarlo. Tonight, my guest is Mr. Gerald Allen Sansing, Ph.D., and I've seen Mr. Sansing around a lot. He has a public access show, and I know he was involved in the Coliseum and uh, did not want the Coliseum tore down. The Coliseum was tore down, which was a building built, I believe, in the 50s, and um, many of us, myself included, for what my opinion was worth, were against it being torn down. There was obviously it was torn down, and then you're you're being sued for some amount of money at, at this time. Is that right, sir? Yes, sir. Right. We're <clears throat> we signed a uh, a bond for thirty thousand dollars, which was exorbitant, really. I, let me back up. Uh, the main reason that I did not want that torn down was that was a memorial to three hundred and ninety three. Uh, veterans of World War II that had perished, servicemen from Nueces County, Texas. It also is a, was an architectural wonder. It wound up at one of the world's fairs as an architectural wonder with that curved roof on it. Now the roof was freestanding and one of the five of us that were sued uh, for that activity, uh, George Clower, an architect, he, he went to a great deal of expense and trouble to show that you could take the walls out of that building and you could take all the interior out and as a freestanding building, then uh, you know, you'd have a, a, a really significant shade area is what was what the Yeah, city it could be used had. for anything, I guess, a right. mall or a gazebo or an right. exercise area, yeah. outside gym or anything. Right. right. And, and put citizens. that plaque back under there to honor, the, honor the veterans. And then put a, a standing seam copper roof on it and let that go ahead and weather and patina. Yeah, and I have you, one over here on the building here. Yeah, right. And it, it's a beautiful greenish uh, you know, color, and so that would, and that would provide about sixty thousand square feet of shade. And now, Destination mm -hmm. Bayfront, those people want to put up shade everywhere because who who wants to be roaming around in that acreage down there in the summertime without shade? So I don't know why they wanted to do that, but we did protest it, tried to get it into the historical uh, system, the society, both state and the federal. And they went ahead and started the demolition of that. And by the time the commission could hear uh, up in, uh, I think they were up at Port Arthur area, uh, then uh, it was too far gone. They'd taken too much of the roof off of that building to, to uh, have it, you know, stopped. So, so you signed a bond. In other words, you promised to pay so much money um, in, in the event that it, that it was successfully, that it wasn't successfully stopped, right? right. That's true. Mm -hmm. And now how, it's $30,000 right. plus bond, attorney's fees? Uh, well, it's, it's been negotiated. The city actually uh, sued us for $65,000, and that included uh, damages and so forth and delays in construction. Now, if you go back to the original contract between the city and A&R Demolition Company, there's a clause in there that states very clearly, if there's a court-ordered uh, cease, restraining order, from demolition or whatever, then uh, there will be no damages that occurred by the city. So uh, the, the city has then, then told us, and I'm, I'm not a, an attorney, but he, they've said that that was uh, really not anything that we could rely on, that any contract between the city and a vendor uh, no citizen, no taxpayer has any right and, and any interest in that contract so that the city could do anything they wanted to. All right, well, how much your money are they saying that, that the five people owe? 30000 The judge, it, The judge did hear uh, you know, both sides of the case and made the ruling that uh, we owed them $30,000. Okay. So the people that are judgment-proof, they can't pay it. They're not going to pay it. 
I don't know if anybody's judgment proof, but there's a lot of people that are judgment proof. Right. In other words, they have no assets that you could get to because they don't own any property other than their own home. They don't have right. over two thousand dollars in the bank. So those people, I guess, if there's any of them, will be judgment proof. And where's that case at now, where you're being sued for attempting basically to stop the uh, whatever destruction or tearing down of the demolition of the uh, Coliseum. Well, it, it stands right now. We've, we've uh, filed the notice that we're going to appeal it. So that's where we are now. We're in that transition stage between the, the judgment from the uh, uh, judge and then, uh, you know, going... Who was the judge that ruled that you have uh, to pay the money? Oh, my gosh. Uh, um, is it Martha Huerta? She was a previous... So they put a v- visiting judge in. You're right. They, because it might have been a hot political football or something. Well... And none of the yeah. judges wanted to take it on. Right. So instead, they got a visiting judge to decide right. that. Yeah. They, they polled all the judges, the district judges down there, and all of those uh, abstained from... And they all abstained from doing it. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> are you aware of the Court of Appeals and how they usually decide these things? Uh, yeah, in fact, they, they, I would imagine if I've, I've been around enough to know, they'll probably side with the city. <clears throat> when all Nine side times out of ten, they will side with the status quo. Mm-hmm. In my opinion, no matter what the facts are. Okay. And that's, yeah. a, that's something I'm probably not supposed to say as an attorney. Right. practicing here but I'm going to say it right well you know the truth the truth <laughs> and that's the truth and we have to say something on right. here or we wouldn't right. have a very good show would right. we no, that's or true. one of much integrity no well I, but you know what, what really sticks in our crawl is uh, we do have evidence that uh, with the restraining order and they said that they had incurred certain damages to cover that thirty thousand dollars during the downtime the, the, the time of restraint uh, we do have evidence that they were working over there at night in that building, stripping the wire out and so forth, which was, you know, I mean, that's not what the contract said, and that's not what the restraining order said. And Judge Clager is the one that has, uh, the one that, that uh, gave the order, the restraining order, uh, in our on our behalf. And, uh, you know, now the city attorney, uh, Mr. Valdez, is saying that, we were, that our suit was frivolous and all of the rest. So I guess that means that Judge Clager may be a frivolous person by, by you know, uh, ordering a restraining order. The, um, I personally, and I mean, what, different, what good does it do me saying this now, but I thought it was horrible that they would tear down a substantially good building. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and spent... We pay to build it. We pay to tear it down. Now I understand, according to um, uh, Mr. Maloney, who um, has written several books, who he claims that um, we've been now told we can't build anything there. Right. You know, there. I, I think there were uh, certain deed restrictions on that property when part of it was uh, donated to the city. And so. And somebody's looked it up, and they said that you know I, I, there there's some controversy as to whether they can replace anything there. Are Are you interested in the bay? Are you from Corpus Christi? No, no. Where are you from? Uh, well, I'm I'm the uh, son of a uh, fighter pilot, World War II, Korea, Nam, mm-hmm. and that that's another thing. You know, I've I've been around dying uh, veterans all my life uh, with that activity. But um, he was from Bay City, Texas, just up the coast. And then my mother was from Boston area. They met in Boston when he was shipping out World War II. And uh, I was actually born, he was stationed in Illinois, in Champaign, Illinois, at Rantoul Air Force Base there. So, I, and we've moved everywhere. So. Yeah, I saw that, for example, you were at American Academy in Athens, Greece. You graduated in May of 63. Right, and, and that was a... That was a a private school. There weren't enough dependents. Dad was stationed there in, in Athens, and uh, there weren't enough uh, dependents to have a military school. So they, they Greece, it was a British school. Greece was very poor at that time, wasn't it? Yeah, right. I'm yeah. sure that left an impression with you. Yeah, yeah. I've seen some real heartache. Uh, you, know. You, you know, poverty at that time. Then, of course, you're a professor at Delmar now, right? Mm-hmm. You're right. a professor in what? Uh, I teach microbiology mostly. I'm, I've got I've got dual uh, majors all the way through: mm-hmm. chemistry, biology, undergraduate, and then graduate degrees in biochemistry and microbiology. I went to Ohio State in um, one year, my first year of college, and then I think microbiology was considered the big one of the big flunk out subjects if you wanted to be a doctor. 
well, they, they would take that and they would flunk that out. Mm -hmm. They would flunk that. There were like maybe three or four courses. I can't remember all yeah, of them. Organic chemistry. Organic so chemistry. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you wanted to be a doctor and then you would take these courses and then they would flunk you out. So mm -hmm. you may not have that because there may not be many pre-med majors at Del Mar. I've got, I teach mostly the, the pre-allied health, which is nursing and dental hygiene, respiratory, surgical tech and those people, um, you know, that, that are support people. And then I, once a year, <coughs> I do go ahead and teach a major's micro course and I get pre-med, pre-pharmacy, pre-vet, and so forth in that way. And this isn't really on point, but it was legendary at Ohio State how people used to rip things out of books because the competition was so high and it sort of, that sort of shenanigans that would go on to mm -hmm. sabotage other people's grades. Yeah, I, I don't see that here. <coughs> I've, I've seen it at other places. In fact, you in, have seen that. Yeah, I, I was on a postdoctoral position just out of graduate school in Peoria, Illinois. That's the, the um, mecca of antibiotic research since the late 1930s. And I was very fortunate to get that postdoc. But uh, I also did a lot of work with the University of Illinois Medical School, which was right across town. And uh, the medical students are, are pretty cutthroat. It was a very cutthroat situation. Yeah. But, of course, we're not going to hear much about that on the media, are we? No. <laughs> we don't hear that. Uh, you have a lot of background I saw in Alabama. Huntington College, Montgomery, Alabama, Auburn University, Auburn, Alabama. Right. And then a Ph.D. in biochemistry and microbiology in Auburn University in Auburn, Alabama. And Alabama used to be very poor, too. You probably saw right. a lot of poverty there. Right. Well, when, when the... the, the <clears throat> Fighter pilots came back from World War II. Uh, they opened up a base there in South Georgia, in Albany, Georgia. It was uh, Turner Air Force Base. And uh, they had, uh, I spent a lot of years there in the South, in, in South Georgia. Mm -hmm. And then we went from there to one year in Montgomery when I was, mm -hmm. I think, about the sixth grade. And uh, what, what got me back into Alabama was actually I started at Tulane University in engineering, and I hated New Orleans, Tulane, and engineering. That just, you know, at 17, you don't know what you're going to do. So my next door neighbor was a physician, and he got his undergraduate degree at Huntington. And he was a resident there. He, he went to Tulane Med School, and he lived next door to me. So when I told him, you know, I, I just couldn't take the engineering that just wasn't for me, he said, well, go to Huntington over in Montgomery. And he said, are you familiar with Montgomery? And I said, years ago, when we lived there that one year. So that, Huntington's actually a very small school. I think we had like 12, 1,200 students. And it was a real uh, it's a liberal arts school that, that fed into medical school and graduate school. And you know, Yeah, that's not quite as intense yeah. a... Yeah. They're not going to be quite as cutthroat there. Right. And you had an interesting story when we were talking, uh, when I would asked you to come on the show. You said you actually met George Wallace oh, one yeah. time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was there in, at Huntington, uh, there was a function with the, with the college and uh, the governor and his wife. And I met him in a, in a reception line just for maybe 30-second conversation. And uh, so <clears throat> then when I went back over to uh, Auburn, which was maybe an hour drive away, hour and 15 minutes. I, a couple of the graduate students, my fellow graduate students, went back to Montgomery, and we were eating at a barbecue place. And uh, a friend of mine came out of that little private dining area in the back and uh, said, pick up your plates and come back here. Well, I walked back in the back, and Governor Wallace was there. So he stood up and walked over to, the, to me, and he said, Jerry, he said, how are things going and, over at Auburn? And I almost hit the floor. But the man apparently had the, if he met you once, he had the ability to recall your name forever. And it was just amazing. But the conversation got into uh, politics, and they asked him why he stood in the, in the door of the University of Alabama in the segregation days. And he said, well, 70-some-odd percent of the Alabama residents voted me in. I want to keep my job. And if I didn't do that, then I would have been you know, politically dead. That's what the citizens of Alabama wanted me to do. And then it, it evolved a little bit deeper into politics. And he's been quoted in other places as saying this, but they asked him what he thought of politicians in general. And he said, well, you can throw all of us in a gunny sack, which is a burlap feed bag, and shake us all up, reach in there, and pull us out 
by the ear one at a time, and there's not a dime's worth of difference between any of us. And he meant Democrats, Republicans, and independents and everything in between. So that's always stuck with me. You know, I'm, I'm about as, uh, I guess, apolitical as you can get. Well, you know, what was interesting, I, I shouldn't get off on this, but the campaign, his, his campaign was interesting because he actually, I think he got 25% of the vote or 29% mm-hmm. yeah. of the vote. Mm-hmm. And I, it's my belief much of the Republican political agenda the next 50 years mm-hmm. Was, was dominated by him because, remember, he argued for states' rights, right. big states' mm-hmm. rights, and then law and order, which they right. picked up for years. I think maybe lately they've dropped it. Right. But, you know, so much of his political agenda was actually adopted, I believe, by a major party. Yeah. Well, that was, that was the swing when, uh, when the Southeast <clears throat> went from Democrat to Republican. He had a lot to do with that. You know, now the Southeast used yes, to Yes, that's right. It was Democratic. Democratic that's stronghold. Right. <clears throat> with... Um, now it's swung back into Republican. The other thing that you've been involved in a lot is a project called Las Brisas, which I believe is some sort of a energy plant, a coke refining plant. They're going to use some sort of a oil oil product uh, uh, residue mm-hmm. to actually create energy, and then you're you're very much against it because you feel that it's going to cause. A lot of pollution locally, and then uh, many of the physicians jumped on it, um, entered into the political foray, and they said, "Oh yes, it's going to cause this pollution." And uh, you've been very involved in the anti Las Brisas project, which I think is a kind of a hypocritical name for an energy plant, Las Brisas. <laughs> but um, right. tell us about your opposition. Tell us what Las Brisas is. The energy plant is okay. It's, a, it's an electrical uh, generating plant. What they use, it's, it's much like a coal-fired power plant where you, you uh, burn coal in furnaces, heat the water the, the, to steam uh, if, after you get the vapor, and that drives the turbines that, that generates the electricity. So uh, what, they, what Las Brisas did, the, the parent company is Chase Energy Development Company out of Houston, and they own coal-fired plants in other places. What they wanted to do was, when you refine oil, which we do an awful lot here at, in Corpus Christi, and a lot of people don't realize that uh, we've got the highest concentration of refineries anywhere in the country. Now, they're spread out in Houston. They're not just all in a single row down the ship channel. But um, when they, the, the end product of the, of the refining business is a sludge, and they take it in and bake it and it's called petroleum coke. It's almost like lumps of coal when it comes out, you know, and it's, it, it's all the waste material that's left over after all the uh, economic, uh, economically valuable stuff is taken out of the oil for gasoline and petrochemicals and so forth. So what, it, and it, it's high energy. So we generate about 1.5 million tons per year of this stuff. Now, normally it's piled up along the ship channel there. You can go out anytime it's windy, which is 95% of the time here, and you can see the soot blowing off the, those piles of petroleum coke. It's, it's a fine dust. <clears throat> it's called particulate matter. Now, what happens with that is they said they were going to burn that up and get rid of it so we didn't have to transport it. If you go out there when they've got front end loaders moving that pile around and then dumping it into rail cars or trucks, you really see all that dust flying around, the, the black soot. So <clears throat> what they were going to do is, is they, they told the public that they were going to take all that material and grind it up and fire it into these real hot furnaces, there'd be uh, four of them, and then use that to fire the, the power plant. Now, it, that's where all the heavy metals wind up, the, the zinc and mercury and so forth, after you refine the, the oil down. And uh, so they, you know, and then the, there's a real load of carbon dioxide being put out and other gases like uh, the sulfur dioxide, which is uh, when it rains, there's a chemical reaction in the air that you get, you actually rain sulfuric acid. It's called acid rain. So there's a, a great amount of that that was going to be put into the air. And then the nitrogen oxides wind up as ozone producers, which is bad for our atmosphere. So that's the downside of it. Now, they they bent the truth a little bit because an awful lot of that petroleum coke is being loaded up 
and ship to pay people overseas that can use petroleum coke that's real cheap to fire the furnaces with, like China. So they were going to essentially, for a couple of years, they're going to have to take our 1.5 million tons and ship it out and stir up all the particulate matter. And then they were, the reason they want Corpus Christi is they can barge in 4.5 million tons a year is what it's going to require to burn at, uh, you know, to keep that power plant going. So they're going to offload that. Now, the Texas so it's just not going to be the residue or the results from our refineries, but it's going to be from other refineries. Right. Going. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, that, I don't that, think that was understood, but uh, yeah, no. And then, you know, we've, we've tried to educate people. Um, I'm, I was chair of the Clean Economy Coalition, which was a group here that formed. And then uh, we, we were so strong that Sierra Club came in to assist us with all the court battles with that. And so did Environmental Defense Fund. But the particulate matter is what really uh, stirred up the, uh, uh, the physicians. One of our, our physicians that was real involved is uh, Dr. Wes Stafford. He's a local allergy immunology expert, and he's also a uh, board-certified pediatrician. So he, he went to the American Pediatric Association, and they looked at their tables and charts and, you know, the way they formulate these. It's, it's much like an insurance actuarial uh, table, you know, where you, you predict how many people are going to expire and how many people are going to get sick. And they, they put out and said a minimum of 80 infants a year would probably die if that plant went in with the, with, and using uh, Chase Energies or Las Brisas' own emissions that they said they would generate. And of course, you know, once you, they get started, it's, oops, oh, we didn't mean to go over that limit. But, um, well, I was a little bit cynical about the physicians' involvements because they don't seem to state anything else about the water, about gun control, about whatever. I mean, in other words, I thought this was a fairly isolated manner that they chose to pick a political position on because there's all sorts of health matters, you know. Yeah, right. And I well, was a little bit cynical, but I, right. I don't know. Well, they, they also got involved with the water issue. You know, with our <laughs> drought down here, we're really hurting for water. And, they, you know, they, they had the... Uh, Mary Rhodes Pipeline years ago that yes. came in from uh, Lake Texana there at Edna. And now they want to put another $175 million 40-mile pipeline back from Lake Texana over to uh, Colorado River, just west of uh, Bay City. Mm -hmm. And it's dry most of the time. You know, the, even the rice farmers are begging for water over there. And the city did purchase the rights to so much water out of that river from LCRA, the Lower Colorado River Authority. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, what Las Brisas would require is a minimum of 4 million gallons of fresh water per day to heat. And then they have to recondense the steam back into water. Mm -hmm. And then they, they do have a permit application out for a wastewater uh, discharge. So they would be discharging roughly 3.7 million gallons of fresh hot water back into the ship channel, which goes right into the bay. So then, the, I, for whatever reason, the uh, the um, uh, oceanographers and, and marine science people at A and M haven't said a whole lot. Our physicians have been more vocal about that, but that's just going to destroy the the ecosystem in our bay. Are they going to build Lost Breeze? Is this? Coke oil refinery plant. This Coke energy plant is going to be built now. I don't. I don't think so. Why know? is that? Well, for four years we have uh, uh, protested and and gone to court with this with the uh, uh, state office of uh, administrative hearings judges and uh, TCEQ, and it's on hold right now. The 29th of this month is when the uh, when. Uh, Las Brisas, Chase, and so forth have to have responses to the judge's order. I thought they, they really weren't going to build it because, what was it, the price of gas went way down or something? I can't. Well, the, yeah, the, the natural gas is a much cheaper way right. to go these That's days, it. and it's much cleaner. It's, it's uh, so, you know. It is? Because, oh, yeah. yeah it, you, so what do you think of this? There's a, a little bit of a movement in town that, we should be, or some discussion that we should be running our cars on natural gas. Is that possible? Yeah, you can liquefy it. In fact, there's a, a plant, Chenier, is coming in over uh, 
next to Oxychem, I think, on, on the ship channel over there. Mm-hmm. And they, they have got the permits. Uh, I think they've already obtained those to, to liquefy natural gas. They'll just run the, the gas through the pipelines directly from Eagle Ford. <coughs> so that's, you know, that's an awful lot of gas that they found there. That's my understanding is yeah. that there's a... Yeah. a pl- Cutter of gas from yeah, right, right, and then they liqu- <coughs> liquefy that, and then actually they, they've got large uh, ships, <coughs> containers that can can handle that that uh, liquefied gas, and they're going to ship it all over the over the world. I think there's arguments too that it burns. It's better for the engine, isn't it? Isn't it burn cleaner than gasoline? Yeah. Thing? Oh yeah. Yeah. You don't have that. You know. You don't have all the hydrocarbons. <coughs> Excuse me. And then yeah. I understand and too that you um. Some controversy. <laughs> it seems like you're involved in a lot of controversy I, I between am. the Coliseum and, and making your stand against Las Brisas. And then Chris Adler <clears throat> well signs. There would be, yeah. you had the, this red mark through Chris Adler and you distributed signs throughout the Corpus Christi community. Chris Adler was running for mayor, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Against the woman who won. Uh, Right. Nelda Martinez, Martinez won, mm-hmm. and I think they know each other. Maybe even be friends. I, th- I right? think they've been in business together before. Okay. Yeah. So they're running against each other. Mm-hmm. And why did you put out these no Chris Adler signs? Why were you against her? Well, <clears throat> it goes back to me following when my kids were in school in CCISD and some of the shenanigans that that uh, that group down there, you know, the trustees mm-hmm. of CCISD did. And she just seemed to to uh, be a lightning rod for controversy. And I think there were some instances of uh, violation of Open Meetings Act. And it's called, I think, a walking quorum. And that's when you get on the phone with all the trustees and you discuss issues that are supposed to go up to, for public consumption at the open meetings. And uh, so that... that Put a, a little cloud over that, that board of trustees, and, and uh, then she went from there and, and uh, was voted into the board of Del Mar College, which is real close to me. So she was actually a boss, so to speak. And uh, there, uh, she she did several things that really really floored everyone over there. Uh, she would. Uh, if somebody got up there and said anything that she considered to be negative, she would just say you're being negative and call security in and have that person removed from the public comments of the meeting. And then uh, on the other hand, there was a professor that uh, some students got mad at and went to the board members, and particularly Mrs. Adler, and she gave, I think, five or six of them free reign of the meeting to just belittle and degrade and, and demean that professor about how they couldn't understand him. He was an Indian uh, from India, and uh, he, I never had any problem understanding him, but they, they claimed that they did not fare well in his class. He was a very uh, good professor and a taskmaster, you know, and, and they didn't appreciate that. They, didn't, they didn't, weren't just given A's in that class. But she allowed them free reign for, I don't know, it went on for 10, 15 minutes, maybe 20, of just degrading him at a public meeting, a board meeting. And then uh, they showed pictures of inside mm-hmm. of his office. And how did they get into his office, you know, you know and take pictures in there? Because he had, you know, a typical professor, you've got stacks of tiles oh, that everywhere. I well, sure. I don't have to tell you, attorneys are yes. even more inundated with mm-hmm. files. But... Um, <clears throat> The bottom line was he, he finally, uh, they, they went and changed grades for those students, and which is, is unheard of in academics. I mean, you know. The, so they went over the professor's head and they changed his grades? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, anyway, you do that. Uh, she, uh, Mrs. Adler is the one that encouraged those students to speak to the Board of Regents and so forth about that issue. And then uh, he subsequently left Del Mar with a big lawsuit against them. And I, I can't verify this. I've just I heard that his settlement was about $250,000 is what it cost the, the college. Has, haven't there been a lot of lawsuits involved in Del Mar? It seems like I'm aware there was the president of Del Mar and right. some sort of scandal there. And then something about, was it sexual harassment? And then, of course, 
former Judge Westergren was the attorney for Del Mar for years. I don't know if he right. still is or not. No, he he, he is uh, gone. What were some of those controversies that? Well, I I I don't know if I should say anything, Mark, because uh, that's another controversy I'm in, in. When that president was not renewed his contract, then he he singled out two professors that caused his demise, and the, I, I'm one of the two. The other one is uh, uh, Dr. Olson, who's the chair of, of social sciences. He's a PhD historian. And he's also uh, involved with the Coliseum. But he, he now is in a major controversy. But, but Carlos Garcia, Dr. Garcia, is the one that sued the two of us for defamation and, and you know. Yeah, I think I found that lawsuit online, as a matter yeah. of fact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it, um, it, the first, first round was a mistrial. So you actually went to trial on this case? Yeah, yeah. And was one of the... Def and the second one hasn't gone to trial? Are you no, he, we, we, we're, we're, they, they want to run it back through the court. I see. They, I retry it because we had a, uh, a split and, and uh, Judge Hassett declared a mistrial. And did... Um, but that, that, and, that, involved, sorry, that involved uh, several accusations. He, he, he had been sued by certain students for various things. And, uh, what? And they, they did just, you testify at the trial? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And truth is a truth is a defense to slander and defamation, of course, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And then I would assume that you you have a constitutional right to speak too. I would assume that yeah. was raised. Is that right? right. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of skipped around um, because Del Mar has been a subject of controversy. Maybe we can come back to that, but I'm afraid I'm going to f forget about the Chris Adler. So Chris okay. Adler is running for mayor, right. and Mr. And Professor Sanzig says, hey, look, Dr. Sanzig says, hey, look, give her a hard time, man. I'm going to put up these signs. And well, so you put, you, you, who paid for the signs? I did. How many signs did you print? No, Chris Adler. A hundred. And you put them all over. Were there any kind of, imp were there any repercussions? I understand that there were repercussions against you for putting up those signs, or you're the opinion that there were repercussions against you. Yes. Uh, I had, uh, with the drought and being a biologist and chemist, I have two yards, one on either side of the house because my back, pardon me, the back of the house is a driveway coming off an alleyway. So I've got two fenced yards, one to the left and one to the right of the house. And I, I garden in one of them. I've got a raised vegetable garden. And on the other side, I let it go into a xeriscaping you know, because of the drought. And I also had a little pool of water back there that I used to sustain the, the toads that eat bugs and, and the tree frogs because they, they, they were going to disappear if I didn't provide them with a place to, to reproduce and, and, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, two or three days after I put the first sign up, which was in my front yard, uh, <clears throat> I had... Uh, the code enforcement people come by and cite me for tall weeds and, and brush and for stagnant water. So I said, what in the world is this all about? So then on the other side... Had you ever had a code enforcement person at your house before? No, never, never. And has it been your experience, like mine in Corpus Christi, would be my opinion that they generally building codes... It's, they're not enforced, are they? Right, no. Well, I, when I, no, when none I, of the zoning or anything's enforced, I don't think. No, not uh, only the people that, that uh, can't fight it and, and, and afford it. Well, and, and the implication here is that they're using, the only time they use it is it may be a political cudgel against people they disagree with. Well, they did with me. Now, I don't they know did about with you. other people. Well, I don't, but, I don't know what else they're using it for because yeah. you can look out throughout the city and, and know, you know. Well, when I parked in the back. There's dogs, know. there's uh, junk, there's metal buildings where they're not supposed to be, right. there's junk in yards, there's high weeds. But I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, right behind your fence back here. I, when I pulled into the yes. drive here, that there's a, a great deal of. Well, you, of you, brush you, you, I, you, you know what happened is, is someone went and cut down. My next door neighbor went down and cut down all these trees, dumped them on that back lot. So there's a virtual fire waiting to happen, right. and I complained about that mm -hmm. huge dump in my backyard. Nobody, I, they never even responded. No, but they nope. come into my privacy fence. That you, you it's an empty lot. Yes, sir. Yep. 
I mean, it's my totally fenced off. Nobody can see what's in there. But I did have ornamentals, and I did let the, my uh, grass grow a bit. But I have subsequently asked them for a list of the scientific names and the common names for what they consider to be uh, weeds and brush and stagnant water. And I haven't, I, I did not get a response. How, how much did you receive in citations? How much? Like, was there a dollar amount? They said, look, we're giving you a right. ticket for this, for this, for this. And how much did, was right. each one, and what did they amount to? Okay. At the time, my wife was, was ill, as you know, and I lost what her back in I'm October. sorry to hear that. And uh, so <laughs> we went down to the, the hearing. You know, you summons into that. So they sat there, and when I'm by time came, and uh, we were really, I guess, one of the first two uh, that were there. Uh, the judge said... Here's the citation, and it, it's for tall weeds and brush and stagnant water. So it's a $2,000 fine Dude. for tall weeds and brush, and then it's the $500 for stagnant water, and then $64 for court costs. So he said, that's levied against you, Mr. Sansing. And then he said, is this Mrs. Sansing? And, and she said, yes. Well, it's also $2,000 for you and 500 for stagnant water and $64 court cost because we're going to find both of you as co-owners of that house. But did you go to a trial first? You're, no, you're skipping no, the... No, this was, this was just show up for court. Okay. Okay. And then he said, you've got two ways you can handle this. You can either go ahead and plead uh, guilty, no contest, and go over and negotiate with the little prosecutor here, or you can uh, request a jury trial. Well, at that time, I, you know, a, a jury trial would have cost me a whole lot more than even if they'd stuck me with the $5,000 total. So we went over to this little table that's sitting right there in the middle of the courtroom with the prosecutor. That's and, how it works, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and she, she negotiated and said, okay, we'll drop the, the fines for your wife, which I thought was rather benevolent. <laughs> and then if you'll pay $500 and the, the $64 court costs, we'll just go ahead and... Uh, call it quits, but you have to come back in 90 days mm -hmm. to see if you're in compliance. So uh, at the time I got the citation is when we did have some rain back in May, and the crews that I used to clean up my yard, my wife was just very upset with the whole thing. She said, go out there and level it. I want all the rocks out. I want the, the pool out. I want everything. Don't want any, any shrubs, trees, or anything. Just level the entire uh, fenced in area and I said that's a little extreme she said I don't want to and you know with the Coliseum and stuff she didn't want me in she had enough action on her hands you know. sure so anyway uh, we, we know the, the crew uh, my partner on my show uh, is a is a yard he was one of the, on the yard crew there at Del Mar before they fired him and then they rehired him as a porter well that's another story but anyway, so we went ahead and, and could not get them in because that's when uh, Cal Allen was torn up by the windstorm and they had all the tree limbs down. So all the crews were out there making big money. So I missed the eight-day cutoff on, on having the thing done. And then that's when we had to go to court with it within 90 days. Well, when I went over there, uh, the the young lady that went back over, it was not the original person from the uh, uh, ordinance. But she said, well, you're in compliance with the original citations, but now I've found some more things, so you're going to have to come back to court. You're not in compliance. And I said, well, what are the two, what's the connection between the two? Well, you're not in compliance with these others, so we're going to recite you for these. So <clears throat> she was showing uh, pictures to the judge of what the, what the uh, infringement was or, or whatever they call it, you know, my... my uh, crimes and I looked at the I said can I see those pictures and I looked at them and they were bales of hay that I used as mulch on my garden which was on the other side of the house not the original one that was cited so I said lady I said do you know what that is and she said yeah that's solid organic waste material and I said no it's called hay it's called a bale of hay I said obviously you've never been on a farm or around a horse or a cow or you'd recognize that. And I said, I use that for mulch. And then all of a sudden, boom, she said, oh, well, uh, 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 and then she's 
had a picture of some wooden stakes that I had leaning up against the house. And four of those metal T posts, they call them, you know, the, the green ones. Yeah, I thought everybody had stuff like that in their backyard. If right. you're going to have a viable property, you almost need something, you know what I mean? Rocks or something yeah. to, to yeah. use for landscaping yeah. or something. Yeah. But they, they said that those, those were illegal. So I blew up. I'm surprised the judge didn't hold me in contempt and had me hauled off by the bailiff. But I, I started asking him and her and, and everybody in the audience that was waiting to be fined. I said, how many bales of hay can you have in a fenced-in area and be legal? How many fence posts? And but at that time, you hadn't been cited for the new citations, though. For, you no, this was after. Yeah, they cleared me of the first one. Okay, so then and this was when I went for that. What was the result of the new ones? Well, I went ahead and, and uh, that same day went back over to the code enforcement, ran into the original guy, Mr. Salazar, the officer Zach Salazar, that had cited me first. And I asked him about things. You know, I said, how many bales of hay? He said, I don't know. I said, well, how can you cite me if there's no code or something that you can't refer to? And I said, you still haven't given me the, the common and, and scientific names of what a weed and brush is all about. And he, he dodged that one. And I said, well, how about the, the, the stakes? I use those to prop up my tomato cages. They're four feet long wooden stakes like you see with a lot of these political signs around. And... <laughs> He couldn't answer that, and he said, well, if, they, if in a high wind they'll go airborne and become missiles. I said, so... Well, so what was that? I don't mean to interrupt you, but what was the ultimate result of the new violations? Well, he came out. I was filming my show, and it, it was just reading my, my uh, Public Information Act request when I heard a bang on the door. I, you know, we, we do these in our own properties. Yes, sir. And it was Officer Salazar, and that was the day before the hearing for the second go-around that mm -hmm. I was going to go do. So I shut the camera off and went walking around with him, and I wasn't real pleasant, but he went and said, oh, well, you're in compliance now, so when you go down there tomorrow, I'll, I'll go down and tell the judge you're in compliance, and that's the end of your, your round with, uh, with the... Uh, so, so all this, this corresponded when you put out the no Chris Adler signs, right. mm -hmm. and you're impliedly believing that. And of course, Ms. Adler could come on if she chooses sure. to or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, you're, you, and you believe it may have, obviously, it may have um, coincided with that. Yeah. Well, there was another gentleman that, that put up the second of the hundred signs in his yard across town. And uh, the code enforcement was in his backyard saying he had tall weeds and brush. Yes. So, you know, that I don't believe in that big a consequence as a scientist. <laughs> well, when you have too many, when you have too many uh, coincidences like that, mm -hmm. um, obviously it's, you, you know, there, there's more to it than that. Right. Um, we also have some other, we have a, another fact, since you're involved in, apparently are you concerned about the pollution from the, coke refinery plant that they're talking about building here there's another plastic factory from uh, i believe it's a, an italian plastic factory they're talking about building here what's the story on that i i've heard i haven't heard any complaints about that or about the chinese one that they're going to be building pipes yeah i haven't heard complaints about either one of those what's your opinion on the chinese factory where they're going to be building pipes and the italian plastic factory okay the the pipe company um is is chinese owned uh and they're building that over uh gregory portland area mm -hmm. and it's it's going to be a, a very large plant now the connection that i saw i, I read their air permit for, you know application and that would be minimal pollution added to to our environment around here are these steel use, pipes yeah they're stainless these? steel pipes for, for okay stainless. Like, like huge Huge steel. No, I, I think they're, they're for drilling. You know, that may be okay. what six to twelve inches. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure what size all they're right. going to put out. But they all their processes, their furnaces, and all are electric power. And electric's cleaner than gas or, oh, yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, or coal or whatever. So, I, I how many employees is that supposed to have? Do you know? I think they were looking at eight hundred. So that's big, significant. Significant number right. of mm -hmm. probably possibly well-paid employees though you wonder why they don't you know everybody works in china for slave wages you wonder right. why they don't build them there and bring them but well apparently there's a reason well that's it's all the the uh, uh deep drilling we're doing now 
Okay. You know, and, 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 and then what about the Italian plastic factory? What, what are they going to build? Mm-hmm. They're going to manufacture plastic or plastic products. You know what it is? Uh, it's, I think that they're going to be the resin producer. They're which will go resin. into, I, I don't know if they're going to build, make bottles or, you know, toys or whatever right. out of that. I have not really had the time with all the other activities to sit down and, and take a real hard look at their permit requests or applications. Uh, we've got other people in our group, Clean Economy, and they say, well, you know, it's kind of borderline. But we, I need to take a look at their wastewater uh, discharge permit. That's going to be the one. How much how much residue from the plastics mm-hmm. are they going to dump into that ship channel? So so you haven't really researched that one no, I haven't carefully had, yet. No. What about since you're bringing up plastic, I hear that there's, and, you're, and you have this background in, you know, Various scientific fields, biochemistry, chemistry and biology, etc. I hear all these complaints that there's no PC. What is it? No PCB, P plastic bottles, and the PCP some sort of is is leaching into our uh, into the water bottles, into the water from the water bottles. Yeah. What's that whole issue well, about? The, the issue is you you use certain chemicals to set those resins up. You know they're they're what are called polymers, which means they're you, you take small molecules and you polymerize those to make big ones, which is the plastic industry. And in that, you have things called plasticizers, which will set the, the, the plastic up. And those are, those are fairly toxic. So if you do have certain beverages in a plastic bottle, in the past, that would leach out into the product, and then uh, people would consume that. And then back when I was... Uh, just out of graduate school and doing a lot of the toxicology studies uh, and keeping up with that, there were people that had fairly significant amounts of those plasticizers in their in their blood from the use of plastic bottles. So I, I usually try to avoid the plastic if I can. Okay, so you don't advise people? But, I mean, you personally don't drink plastic out of plastic bottles ordinarily. Right, no. And are you inferring that you'd advise people not to drink plastic out of plastic bottles? No, I think it's become, with, with all the toxicological studies and all, it's become much better. And yeah. what about, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, what about some of these other issues that you hear about that it's so toxic to heat up food in microwaves in, um, in, in styrofoam? Well, then again, you get the you get the chemical components that will will come mm-hmm. out of that into the food. Are there any other issues like that that have come to the fore that you're you're interested in your profession or that you speak about in your classes? Yeah, I I, I discuss that, and and usually where it comes up is is somebody would say, oh well, goodness, you know, are there certain products that'll take more of those plasticizers out? And I said, well, yeah, uh, if you if you drink alcohol, you know, that that's a pretty good solvent for some of that. So I said, if you're going to drink, then I'd, what I'd do, if you buy a bottle of vodka, I'd get one in glass container rather than plastic. The plastic container is something new, I think, for those. Yeah, a lot, of, of, liquor, the, a lot of the liquors mm-hmm. are, you know. And, uh, so you don't, you don't, okay, so you're saying. I, I, I avoid it. I, I'm not totally clean. Right. You know, if, if, I'm, if I'm out and uh, buy a soda, which I, I don't drink that much of. Uh, you know, it, that's in a plastic bottle, and then if I stop yeah, orange juice on a or trip, something, yeah, you, know, um, you know, with the uh, bottled water on a trip, then I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not just terribly afraid of it, but I think that that we use far too much plastic, and then try to get rid of it. Although Corpus Christi uh, solid waste is doing a good job with recycling. Uh, I know, you say, you say, I'm sorry. You know, the, you can recycle the plastic. So the dumps get full of that, and then you can get some. They, they say try to. That you say try to get rid of it. There's this new issue in Corpus Christi about the plastic bags. Mm-hmm. Oh well, we yeah. need to get rid of plastic bags. I think Austin's got rid of the plastic bags. Yeah, in Brownsville. And, and oh, it's Brownsville. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, do you have an opinion on that? Or well, it, it's it's you, you. They're unpleasant to see flow blowing around. The neighborhood. That's one of well, the yeah, things. Well, yeah, they do. Here in the wind, you know, the sure. aesthetics of the thing, uh, and then in in the they they last an awful long time in the dump. So that's quite. You, you think know. they could make that stuff biodegradable or something? Yeah, there are certain plastics that are, are you know, biodegradable. And then, and then I don't know. I mean, this is an aside. I wonder. I said, why don't they just drill some holes in those in those plastic bags, and then they wouldn't fly like that? Maybe I don't know. Yeah. Well, one thing that's very common right now is they got this all the fracking. 
and and a lot of the people on the um, are asserting that fracking is a major cause of pollution and then something that that might be within your specialty more than the claim that it's causing earthquakes etc in certain parts of the country mm -hmm. so do you have a and i understand that it does they you know they inject this high pressure water etc into the ground it has chemicals it, and there's some debate about that do you have an opinion regarding whether or not it pollutes water or the groundwater or it could pollute the bay or how it's going to affect us here well, the, the groundwater is what I'm most concerned about. If, if you look at a cross-section of the, the earth, they're drilling down, you know, 1,000, 2,000 feet, which is quite a distance, and maybe even more than that at times. Well, there are different strata where you have the, the water table, you know, the underground water, and, and like an aquifer. So you've got a, a layer of soil, and then you've got a layer of water, and then you've got the, the, the shale and stuff below that. So when you drill through that water, they're supposed to encase the, the drilling pipe so that there's no pressure that can come up and, and the chemicals that they use to frack this stuff, uh, you know, uh, doesn't come back up through the pipe and then into the water table because that can be some fairly toxic stuff. So that's the problem is getting through that layer of water without uh, contaminating it and trying to seal it off so it doesn't, that you don't have a, a leak. Hence the... Stainless steel seamless pipes you're going to yeah. be making, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so, are you, are you of the opinion then that that's the problem? Has it been seen to be a problem? There is things shown on the internet, people setting fire to the water coming out of their uh, kitchen faucets. Is that true? Is that alarmist? Well, no, it, it's true. I mean, when, when you have that pressure, you've got the gas that comes up into the water table. And you've got the mixture of the methane gas, natural gas, with the water. And then if, they, if people like San Antonio are on an aquifer system where you, they just drag the water right out of the aquifer, or if you're out in a rural area where you don't have anything, you know, you don't have any processing of your water, you're getting it straight out of the well, then with that methane in there, there's enough, I think that was in Colorado and Pennsylvania, you can go over with a match and uh, the gas is there in the water coming out the faucet and it'll ignite well you know in areas that pennsylvania is very beautiful mm -hmm. you know and you know ohio is beautiful too not quite as much as pennsylvania but it was very beautiful too but where we're fracking <laughs> i hate to say this yeah. is like desert anyway right right mm -hmm. and, and i'm saying well i don't know what's the big deal it doesn't even i mean obviously i'm speaking as a lame and out of ignorance it, I say, it's right it doesn't look like there's any water over there to even worry about. No, but it's, it's almost like a blessing, I'm thinking, because a lot of that land is almost unusable, isn't it, yeah, that they're but, fracking on here? Yeah. Well, the, the land is, but they've got the huge aquifers that are under that. That's the... the, the so there are aquifers there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, San Antonio gets most of their water from the aquifer, that uh, Edwards aquifer. Ha have you taken any kind of political involvement in the fracking or stated any opinions no, or any studies or anything like that? No. Uh, I've, I've been following the studies. I know uh, Sierra Club is uh, very involved with that at this stage. And um, you've been doing a public access show for quite a few years, is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, I back, uh, I think we discussed when David Hughes was here, the attorney and... and uh, <coughs> Uh, Debbie Owen Sahaki was doing the Parrot in Connection. And that was just after the uh, Time Warner, their predecessor. And I, I, for the life of me, I can't remember who, who opened that. And then Time Warner bought them out. But they had the studio over there at the Time Warner facility. I, th I mean, I hate to say this. I forgot the name, too. But I think one big corporation, hey, yeah. wasn't one big corporation yeah, well, same was, as another. You know, right. It was another me. one of the entertainment uh, uh -huh. groups. And uh, so... Then we, we also discussed that all of a sudden that the studio got smaller and smaller every week when you go into film. Yeah, that was pretty, I thought whoever was on the city council at that time, that was pretty bad, wherein they closed down that public access studio. Mm -hmm. under the, And there was even a false pretense stating that there was nobody using it. That wasn't true. It was no, it used wasn't. constantly, right. that mm -hmm. studio. Right. Yeah. And um, obvi what was the what? How did they? I can't remember how they manipulated that. What was the reason for the manipulation of getting? Well, it was costing a lot of money for the right. Yeah, you know, I mean, for them to run that studio. Right. 
what well, that's the that's the agreement that the city made with Time Warner to hang the cables, you know, along the all the utility poles around here and, and go into the individual. Oh yeah, <clears throat> that was part of their their charter. They called it, and uh, that they would provide that studio and then two channels. We've got this one which is ten that you air on, and then there's the other one which is eighteen, and. Uh, uh, so they they had to provide a studio for people to go in and and, and make their shows, but when they dried that up, I, I, the story that I heard and and I can't verify this, but uh, that the Time Warner bought some uh, computer monitors or some equipment for the city council people when they said, well, that's okay, and see, Grande never did have to to. Uh, provide a studio. All they have to do is just take the feed from Time Warner directly into Grande. Yes, and it's my understanding that oftentimes there's problems with that feed from Grande Communications. The sound is bad, etc., and so people really aren't getting uh, public access. Right. In fact, I had I had a call just this morning from Time Warner. I mean, from Grande. I, I subscribed to Grande for a long time, and I'm not advertising for them, but I didn't have near the problems with them that I've had in the past with Time Warner, which stimulated me to switch but uh, now that I, I get calls all the time when the show's airing and they say well the volume's not there or it's a blank screen and nothing's there and then it stops and you know uh, hesitates and so forth so that happened to me this past week and I called Sam Marcus is where they're from and their, their uh, supervisor called me today my understanding is that public access is basically being attacked all over the country now, mm -hmm. and they're, they're right. becoming less and less of it, which is discouraging, especially given the domination by corporate media and party line ideas, mm -hmm. right? Right, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you've got quite a following with your show, and I've got a, probably a different group I, that, that you know, I, I, I know. get feedback all the time on mine. I, I don't get a lot of feedback. Really? No, I don't. I don't. Yeah. I don't know why that is. Maybe I'm. People think I'm kind of mean or something. They don't want to talk well, to me. Just I'm just joking. Call the man. He, he does an excellent show. Believe me. Thank you very much me for a long time. Um, um. So you've been and and interestingly enough, I mean, I've seen you on the show and you had the no loss briefs. Yeah, that's signs. my uniform. I, I swore that you know since when I took that up and we first printed those T-shirts. When I did a show, that I'd wear that, and people are always kidding me, mm -hmm. saying, "When are you going to wear that well, T-shirt out?" <laughs> I think that symbol began, and correct me if I'm wrong, with no nukes, right? Yeah, in the, that was the, a no nukes. Yeah. Well, what do you think about well, your? Since you're so involved in energy, and you you have these credentials, mm -hmm. what do you think of the of nuclear power? What do you think of the disaster recently in Japan? Is nuclear power would that be better than having this coke refinery plant, Las Brisas here? As far as I'm concerned, and I, I took a nuclear physics class undergraduate, and then I took nuclear chemistry in, in graduate school, so I'm, I'm not speaking out of turn. And uh, my physics professor there at Huntington actually uh, lived in Montgomery, and he had a big laboratory named after him at Auburn, and he, he was uh, should have had three Nobel Prizes in, in nuclear chemistry and physics, but he didn't. Oh, Fred Allison. But... Uh, what what we have is France has never had a problem, and their a real high percentage of their electrical output is nuclear power plants. And what they do is they build small ones around and separate them out. But here, you know, we've got to have these grandiose uh, ones up here at Bay City that will run half the United States. And once you get into that size, you do run into a, a lot higher risk of having it's a meltdown. And then why the Japanese would put one right there on the on the coast, except they need the water for cooling, you know, they're, they're on that uh, saltwater basin that they had. And with the earthquakes they have, uh, you know, I would have spread them out over there too. But no, I, I think nuclear power is probably the way to go. Make a, get a nuclear power sports car, you'd really have something, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if <laughs> you look at the, I know if you look at the Navy, though. I mean, you know, they all their nuclear power submarines, right? You know, and, and aircraft carriers. So you can what, have you ever have, has there been any disasters with the nuclear power subs that you know of, or any real problems? Nothing that I know that's been blatantly reported. I know sometimes they have a scare when the you know when the uh, temperatures go up and so forth, but they've got pretty good controls on those, and those are very very small. And, and how how let, let's say the engine of a. Would you have a small nuclear power plant? How big was the engine, or 
or what would you call it for the to, to power a nuclear sub? As big as this room, or uh, probably a little bit smaller. Than a little this. bit smaller than this yeah. room. What you do is is it you have a uh, certain particles that are emitted when those uh, uh, various atoms fall apart, and one of them is called a gamma radiation, gamma ray. And it's real small, real fast, real powerful, and that's the one you have to shield with a, quite a, a, a large amount of lead, you know, mm -hmm. dense material. But when you expose water to gamma radiation, it, it heats it up to steam very quickly. So the the reason that you want the power plant on the boat is you've got all that seawater, you can suck it in the side, you can go ahead and convert it to steam, run the, the engines with the steam power, you can generate electricity with it, and then you can go ahead and condense it, and you've got all the drinking and shower water. Which well, you can well, Mr. Uh, Sansing, I wanted to thank you, Professor Del Mar, for coming on the show. I wish we could get into the idea of what they're going to do with the nuclear waste and that whole, uh, okay. that, that whole debate, maybe on another show. Thank you very much for coming okay. on, uh, Professor okay. uh, Gerald Sansing. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Mark. Good night.